there and welcome to NTA Parliament. The program is Gender and Parliament. This time we are focused on gender issues and our guest, Adara Onyechere, is the head of Women and Gender Affairs and other cross-cutting issues for the African Union ECOSOC Cluster Committee. You're welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Now, I'm intrigued by the addition of other issues, you know, cross-cutting issues. Absolutely. Because we are used to having women and gender affairs. Absolutely. What are these cross-cutting issues? Um, first of all, I want to start with what the role for the African Union, especially at that level, is in talking about gender and women affairs, especially in the age where we're talking about uh, equality, parity, participation for women, and of course, mainstreaming the gap of women in financial and economic inclusion. And in February 2020, at the um, African Union Summit, where we had African Union heads of state come together, the conversations that were highlighted were issues that crossed across, uh, cut across both the health, um, political participation, agriculture, finance. Um, you're looking at education, you're looking at oil and gas, you're looking at mining. And so these are the other cross-cutting issues when you're looking at that in that spectrum. And so the reason why that is significant in that cluster is because um, most times when women think gender and they think equality, when women think women affairs and they think equality, the first thing that comes to the minds, especially for us here in Nigeria, perhaps not in other African country, is women in politics, um, women in governance. No one's really looking at women in policy making. No one is looking at women that cross other sectors uh, in agriculture and rural development, in policy development, in education, in health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's become significant as decided because um, we are looking at an African Union uh, declaration year uh, for the year 2010 to 2020, and from 2020 to 2030 to be the decade of financial inclusion for women. And so when you're thinking financial inclusion, that means that every other cross-cutting issues will definitely have to marry within that subject. So now, before now, you did work gender issues and all that uh, within the country. So how is that um, going to help you in your new role? I think that, you know, the conversations we've been having for a long time has, you know, seen this come into play. Um, the conversation on how loud our voices are, but not just beyond the loudness, but how implemented are those conversations within uh, the, 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 the loud call for gender mainstreaming. And I think my intention or my deliberate actions to look at those conversations as key uh, is what has come to bear today in this position. And I think what is most significant for me is not just the position of the title or is the significance of what the role will achieve and how it, it will enhance, you know, to reach the gap of some of those conversations we have been having, especially for us in Nigeria. Remember that the African Union um, has member states of up to 55 states. And um, progressively and interestingly so, we have seen a lot of, you know, um, updated progression uh, from across other states. Some states have seen Africa having at least 10 countries globally noted for having women mainstream at the parliament. So you're looking at Rwanda, you're looking at Namibia, you're looking at South Africa, you're looking at Senegal and other countries as such as that. And then you have other countries that has looked at, you know, looking at gender parity at policy development and also rural development, such as a country like Madagascar, Ghana, etc., etc. Now, if you now come into the total hub of the African states who are member states of the African Union, there seems to be a progression. But what we are also looking is that those states become a model for the rest of Africa. Those states become the activators for the rest of Africa. And that's why the decade of financial inclusion and economic inclusion for women is one of the pivots for, dri for driving this conversation. And I am quite privileged to be taking this responsibility within a time when the drive to look at issues such as financial inclusion for women is key. Remember that if you're looking at the financial inclusion for women, I think it's significant. Why? Because there is just a very thin line between poverty and equality. Without meeting the gap and looking at the financial status, looking at the inclusion of women at financial 
inclusion, both looking at the fact that women make up 70% of the informal traders, the informal sector and population of the Nigerian population and even that of Africa is become key. We're looking at the time when the Africa free trade, you know, uh, zone conversation is expanding and you're looking at the border. Uh, conversation on who are those who travel the borders the most. They are the women, they are the traders, they are those in agribusiness. How do we create policies within the financial sector to be able to give them a room to be able to express themselves through policies that protect, give them accessibility, makes the infrastructure available, and also attends to their need by making them affordable. So these are significant conversations. And I think building from where I have, uh, I have had those conversations done, from being a broadcast journalist, a community you know, reporter, engaging in gender conversations, being an advocate for women's mainstreaming, I think it's, it's not yet to huru, but we are having those conversations, and this is the birth of that. Now, let's talk about Nigeria specifically in uh, financial inclusion, uh, as you're talking about. How are we doing? I think that, first of all, we are looking at the fact that, one, Nigeria, in the conversation of the African Union, is a member state. Um, a significant one at that, because we continue to hold significant conversations to increase our understanding of what other African countries would require, you know, to be partners to the Nigerianness and the Nigerian conversation, and how Nigeria also partners with other African countries. Uh, remember, there have been a lot of, you know, conversations and arguments that Nigeria seems to be louder in other African countries by participating in issues rather than looking inwards and having that conversation first. However, I also like to think about it differently. I think that when you subject that to critical understanding and critical analysis, what you will see is that there is a modicum of courage from just participating, engaging, and looking at comparative review of what Africa as a whole, where Nigeria stands to gain from, is experienced within that committee. Now, I, I want to also look at the fact that the February 2020 this year, the African Union heads of state sat and met. Nigeria was part of that conversation. And yes, we do know that the issue and the conversation on financial inclusion for women is a progressive conversation. You're looking at policies. So for the African Union, that meeting alone was to activate and harmonize intentions and conversations within the member state countries who have signed you know, some of the protocols and treaties within the Beijing Conference, you know, the Maputo Protocol, the African Union Charter on Human Rights, all of those policies are signatures of, of having African countries make intentional, deliberate efforts to look at those policies as a guiding factor. Remember, people will say we talk policies. We keep talking about the conversations of signatures or having us being signatories. But I want to state categorically that without policies, we will not have effective monitoring and evaluation process for countries, especially for Africa. Those policies are the governing technical um, technical platforms and templates for African government to be able to look at what their government is doing, how they are also understanding and obeying the treaties and how it affects their country. Now, for instance, like the Maputo Protocol, which is also a charter on human rights, which includes gender equality and right to justice, you have about 42 countries who have signed, remaining about 16 or 15 countries. Nigeria is also part of that and doing quite well. But we are saying that those are the kind of guidelines that help you to know how far our country is doing in Africa within the African Union, you know, committee of states in SGBV, how far are they doing with GBV, how far are they doing with politics, how far are they doing with governance, how far are they doing with inclusion, with policy making. So I think that with us in the engagement for financial inclusion, we're also looking at policy friendly engagement that will have women protected, given access affordability and also availability of the financial, you know, um, uh, act activated products, such as credits, such as loan, such as training in agriculture, such as free trade, where women are also be, uh, able to be protected in terms of the tariffs that matter and also looking at the, the, the activation of certain taxation 
institutions that are not gender friendly, especially at a growing level for SMEs that are run by women. So these are some of the conversations we're having. And that's where Nigeria stands at with financial inclusion. And so I say that um, for the African Union ECOSOC you know, Committee on Gender and Women Affairs, that is actually, in fact, our first stance. Our first, you know, prior, and our priority is to begin to look at first financial and economic inclusion for women. Because this is the decade and the declaration of the decade of financial inclusion for African Union for women between the year 2020 to 2030, we need to at least see at least we have at least 70 to 80 percent of financial inclusion for women across the African Union, you know, member states. And I'm hoping to see that Nigeria can also look at how to shove up and encourage and put it as a priority. Because like I said earlier, there is only a thin line between poverty and equality. And so if you empower a woman, she's able to have financial independence, she's able to participate in elections, she's able to start a business, she's able to engage in family and welfare, you know, at the primary level. And this is key because, I mean, we are both women. The majority of women put 70% of their resources in, back into family, back into their business, back into welfare that has to do with their family. And so you empower a woman, and when you say you empower a woman, you empower a country, it's not just the cliche. It's actually very instructive because that is what we live with in our daily lives. So in this, where is the, the vulnerable? Where do they come in? Because, um, you know, already they are the vulnerable, Absolutely. those with disabilities. Absolutely. You, you know, are they part of the, the group that you're closer? Absolutely. I think that when you look at the African Union ECOSOC Cluster Committee, there are about 10 of them. And within those 10 clusters or more, you will find security and peace, you will find health, you will find politics, um, you will find um, economics, you will find different, you find gender and women affairs. Now, the, the vulnerable persons and persons living with disability are a section of every cluster so whether you have 20 clusters or 10 clusters, you will find that they're in economics. You have those who are vulnerable and living with disability, you have in health. And so it is a cluster that is a sub-cluster in all the clusters. So we are significantly taking pride to look at those key areas. So even if we have a cluster that perhaps might look at it as a whole conversation, but I believe that intentionally the African woman uh, is, is engineered to look at the fact that in as much as the, the, the gender in, in, in inverted comma, is a vulnerable group, which is, of course, talking about the women gender. But under that vulnerable group, there's still a, a more, you know, um, will I say, um, pronounced vulnerable group of persons who are living with disability who could also be women. And so for me, I think that is critical in our conversation. We want to see more persons living, you know, differently, like I like to put them, or different, enabled differently to occupy offices, to be able to be part of policy making. I mean, we have a significant voice in Nigeria, Lois Aota. We would want to see more Loises. We want to see a lot more people shoring up their strength in the areas of their capacity. And I think that for the African, African Union, it is a significant conversation that we are having right now, and that is key in all the engagements across Africa and not just in Nigeria. If you're just joining us, the program is Gender and Parliament on NTA Parliament, and we are talking with Adora Onyechere. She is the head of Women and Gender Affairs and other cross-cutting issues for the African Union ECOSOC Cluster Committee. Don't go away. We'll be right back. If you just joined us, the program is Gender and Parliament on NTA Parliament, and we are still talking with Adara Onyechiri, the head of Women and Gender Affairs and other cross-cutting issues for the African Union ECOSOC Cluster Committee. Now, let's talk uh, women participation in politics, and uh, that's about governance and leadership. The role of your uh, committee in helping women to be more visible? 
I think, um, first of all, I know, I think I wouldn't use the word think that one of the roles of this um, cluster committee is to look at the legislative, the policy and the administrative mechanisms of, you know, women's participation in politics, uh, governance and policy development, most importantly. And we say this again in reference to what we are focusing at the moment, which is the first key, the financial and economic inclusion for women. And we want to look at, in perspective, the issue of gender budgeting, for instance. Now, you are looking at the constituency project, you are looking at policy development factors, uh, you're looking at, you know, some of the mechanisms of financial engage engagement for women, how many of the MDAs are adopting a gender policy system, uh, gender budgeting policy system to involve and engage more women at the sectorial level. Sorry, when you say gender budgeting. Yes. What is that? Let's talk about gender budgeting. It means having a budget that is gender sensitive. You are creating platforms or pools of financing and funding that significantly looks at issues concerning women. For instance, women and health, uh, maternal mortality, of course, you're looking at putting more money in the areas of, you know, reducing the number of women who are dying from childbirth at the rural level. Now, the way those conversations can be carried through are through the constituencies, through the legislators, through the MDAs. And then you're also looking at the fact that we're developing policies. For instance, when we say uh, women should run for offices, how do we finance those conversations? How do you build pools and policies that engage and encourage financial platforms for women to be able to enhanced participation, getting the nomination or rather getting, you know, a form to run for office before you even become nominated is a huge task for women in Nigeria, for instance. I mean, you understand the amount of money you must spend in campaign. So again, you're falling back to finance, you're falling back to economy. So how do you do, how do you do the basic? And the basic is encouraging policies and mechanisms that open up the platter where women can be able to source for funds, where women can access funds that are affordable, that are also available and also accessible. And the reason why I use this key, these uh, key three A's is because a lot of time the, the, the yardstick is always very, you know, it's very glamorous to say, oh, women, financial inclusion, or oh, women, financial, you know, economic empowerment, and which is also part of the African Union, you know, the gender equality and women empowerment, the GWI. But what are the bureaucracies and the bottlenecks that hinder access, availability, and affordability. Those are the policies we're going to be reviewing. And those are where we hope that we will show up mechanisms to have participants from across the civil society, the media, the legislators, um, and even the executive and countries, and going down to the rural communities, because that's the key. Uh, I feel that any conversation that we have as a country or as a continent that does not look at leadership from a bottom-up approach is dead on arrival. Because what you have is that if you keep having those conversations from a, a top to the bottom approach, you have the gaps really slim. The conversations are stalled. And so you have the leadership speaking in a different voice box and those who were led are speaking in a different voice box. And so you want to be able to engage categorically from a bottom to a top approach so that by the time the policies are being made at the top, they are also adapted to those issues that are priority to those living at the rural level. And so that's why gender budgeting is really key. That's the way you can say, oh, public schools are a problem in somewhere like Meduguri. We need to put more, you know, uh, quality education, teacher training, Education is essential when you look at gender budgeting. How much of that are we putting into it? The national budget, how much of gender budgeting has been done to accommodate issues of gender? So I'm looking to see a lot of the legislators, especially primary officers, for instance, the deputy chief whip, Honorable Nkiri Konyajocha, who is female, to also see how those conversations can be shoved, which is something that she's primarily interested in. We're looking at the women in parliament in the National Assembly. So these are conversations that are not just for Nigeria, but for other countries. However, we know that there are countries that fare better when it comes to education mainstreaming for women. There are countries that fare better in politics. But I am also very optimistic that as these conversations within the African Union member states, Nigeria would take its rightful position in having those conversations become priority. And it only begins with ourselves here and our leadership having political will. 
our leadership having <laughs> political will. And I guess you will be getting all the support. I want to believe you have all the support to achieve um, your good intentions. You know, let's, girls, the girls, girls in STEM, and then the youth. What is your program for them? Uh, first of all, I think um, importantly is that before this conversation of even having to take up this responsibility, um, I had to do a SWOT analysis. Um, the, the strength, the weakness, you know, the opportunities and the threats of what this position would also be opening up in terms of looking at one, the youth, one, the women and the vulnerables. Now, in terms of the youth, I'm concerned about the young women because that is where, you know, my responsibility lies. I know that the youth have a participation of both the male and the female. But I'm hoping that with this responsibility, we take more cognizance of participation of young girls, you know, both in policy literacy first and helping them to understand the need to get involved, not just in politics, but in development. How do their voices count? Development is key. And what is development? Having to see what happens around in your environment and take you know, notice of certain things that are not right. You don't have clean water. How do we access clean water? We have very limited schools. How do we access schools? Oh, the schools that we have are very far from the rural communities. How do we merge the gap? How do we create mobility, sanitation? Sexual and gender-based violence. How do we also create a platform for young girls to speak out? And that's something that is primarily very important to me because I feel that a lot of women who undergo or young girls who undergo sexual and gender-based violence or gender-based violence as that matter is because of financial and economic dependence. Now, if you have economic and financial inclusion for women, ultimately, you have more young girls also getting access to education. You have more young girls having forums of speaking out. You have empowerment for SMEs. And so with financial independence, you have less women having to tolerate, you know, um, very toxic environment in terms of living with abusers or offenders or having the Stockholm syndrome, or having pity for their offenders and having women who are abused serially within even a legitimate, you know, environment such as marriage have the opportunity to access justice, have the opportunity to finance, you know, new businesses that can empower them and their children. So I think it's really key to have the youth involved, uh, especially the young women, because I believe that the new decade we're going into is for the young people. The young people, when you look at their voices on and offline, you could see restlessness. You could see a sense of dissatisfaction. You can see a sense of, I want this and I want it now. Now, we need to channel those energy into something that is not just productive but sustainable. And that's what we hope to do with this position. So now, let me ask you, if you were to send a bill to, let's say, the National Assembly of Nigeria or even to the Pan-African Parliament, it will be on what? Well, I'm first a broadcast journalist, and a lot of times, in fact, I have been worried about the enabling environment for female journalists in Africa, especially in Nigeria. I believe that the key and the window to maximizing and sustaining the conversation of mainstreaming women's engagement for us starts through the media. And I believe that there should be a policy statement or policy document that orchestrates the engagement of all media, whether it is mainstream media or whether it's traditional media or multimedia, to have at least a sustainable platform that gives opening for women's voices to push the conversation beyond the platforms in which they represent. Secondly, the enabling environment whereby remunerations are key for sustainability and motivation of resources. And why do I say that? A lot of times when we look at the welfare and the social innovation that needs to happen within the environment of broadcasting, whether it be it in print media, social media, or broadcasting, it is abysmal. I believe that more could be done. What can be done to give women licenses to be able to set up you know, media platforms to be able to speak out 
Let's have more, you know, Shonayas. Let's have more Moa Budus. Let's have more policy development platforms that look at mainstreaming women using the media, giving access. Remember that women seem to have a lot of difficulty for visibility during political campaigns because it is expensive. And so for you to be able to sustain that conversation, how are we maximizing the numbers we have within the media block? So my policy and my bill will be on that. And secondly, I would also say that at the rural level, I have also seen that there are a lot of modern happening at the rural level where you have a lot of unemployed women who are not literate. I believe that state governments should take a deliberate action to be able to look at ensuring mandatorily adult education for women at least from a certain age because you can only give what you get and you can you is garbage in garbage out if you're looking at the multiplication and the number of young people we have we can only have the finest minds when they have educated mothers and so educated mothers are going to give birth to younger and bright-minded youth. So edu adult education for women. And finally, a social welfare fund for housewives. I know it sounds a little, you know, domestic and traditional. Somebody will argue with me. But I believe that if a woman decides to be a housewife, it's a job. It's a career. And I believe that the system should be able to accommodate, especially in the area, that's why I talked about gender budgeting, to look at the State House of Assemblies, how they look at these considerations and say, okay, for let's say Imo State, let's consider a bill on how we can have a quota system to empower women who decide to be housewives, say perhaps 50,000 you know, monthly to be able to support what they are doing, especially those who are not learned. I still go back to literacy. So these are some of my key you know, particularly priority bills. <laughs> Before we end this uh, conversation for today, because this conversation will still be going on, um, your aspiration as you go on this new assignment? Is to see a more inclusive society for women across all sectors, not just in politics. My, my, my zeal is that one day we will wake up. We hope that we will actually achieve gender equality by 2030. But for the African Union, we're looking at the Africa we want for 2063. And so that's in, that's in a lot of years to come. However, if by 2030, which is the yardstick or the peg for the United Nations, which is also part of the conversation, and we have actually achieved gender parity, perhaps, say, in education across Africa. That's a win-win situation. Because then you have more educated women who have understanding of what empowerment can do with education. And then you now have more women able to participate in politics. And so for me, I think the aspiration is an equal opportune platform for African women, Nigerian women. We must rise up to the par. Come 2063, we must start now to educate our young girls, policy literacy, what is the vision for you, for Nigeria, what is the Nigeria that you see, starting from your local environment where you are. It could be in your village, it could be in your local government, it could even be where you have resided for a long time. We must become deliberate in Nigeria in seeing the gaps that are hindering women merged and met, at least from a policy development angle. Thank you so much for coming on the program, Gender and Parliament. Thank you very much for having me. We have been talking with Adara Onyechere, the head of Women and Gender Affairs and other cross-cutting issues for the African Union ECOSOC Cluster Committee. Till we come your way again next week, I am Vivian Itekwefo and the program is Gender and Parliament. Let's keep the conversation going on our social media handles as you see on your screen right now. Bye. Thank you.